Thank you, Nero, for the confirmation. Good evening, everyone. I welcome one and all to the next L20 Summit. We have finished two episodes. This will be looking at two eminent speakers and a chairperson who would be taking us through their wisdom on diabetes management and diabetes foot management. Today, being your host, I'm Dr. Sanket Nivale, who's representing medical affairs at Bocart. And the agenda of the meeting goes very simple. We start with the welcome Thank and introduction. The I would have Dr. Alpa Singh from my team who would be doing the introductions. Followed by that would be having the context setting done by our chairperson, Dr. Altamash Sheikh. Followed by that, we'll have our first speaker, Dr. Adeline, who would be do, uh, putting us with her case. And then we'll have Dr. Jain, who would be presenting her uh, presenting with uh, his case on the diabetic foot. And we'll have uh, case discussions followed by summarization from our chairperson and closing. So without any, uh, before we start the event, I would formally like to wish everyone a happy Akshay Tritya and uh, Eid Mubarak to each and everyone attending our event today. So with that note, I would now hand over to our uh, to my colleague, Dr. Alpa Singh, for the introductions. Over to you, Dr. Alpa. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sanket. Uh, myself, Dr. Alpa. So it's my privilege today to introduce our chairperson for the event. He doesn't need any introduction, though, but still, Dr. Alpa Masrik. First, I'll share the screen. Everybody can see it? It's just starting. Yes. Hello, sir? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so, as sir has said that to, for today's scientific agenda, we'll have Dr. Altima Sheikh as our contest setting. Later on, the two case discussion by our speakers, and then we can have our discussions. Uh, Dr. Altima Sheikh doesn't need any introduction, but we know he's an eminent person in the field of endocrinology means our diabetes also so he has received as the first rss ti award for the excellence in diabetes care in the year of 2018 he is also awarded with many more awards like vishwanathan gold medal oration award in 2008 sam gp moses oration gold medal award in 2009 gold medal and dfsi oration at chandigarh in the year of 2015 excellence in diabetic food national award in 2017 He's also a joint treasurer in the Maharashtra Endocrine Society. He's been an editor, section editor in Sadukur International Textbook of Diabetes 2017. He's been a speaker for various national and international conferences and being a co-author in India and abroad for various journals and textbook chapters. With this, I would like to ask Dr. Atama Sheikh to do the contact set and take it forward, sir. I'll stop sharing this first. Oh, Dr. Altmash, sir. Yes, good evening, oh, everyone. Sir. Yes, good evening. Thank you so much. I think it's been a very big day for all of us. Uh, it's Akshay Tritya as well as Eid. Both are going simultaneously. There are some procession. You might hear a lot of sound on the background. So please excuse me for that. I think what we are talking today about on this evening is about something that we see very, very commonly. How important is diabetic foot? I cannot emphasize more and more whenever we talk about a complication of diabetes. And to combat that, we need to know basically what type of treatment would be the best suitable one for a patient with a diabetic foot. That is number one. What is the best way to control in such cases? And number two, what would be more apt? Which kind of treatment, which kind of an antibiotic or so that you would take it from there? As far as the complications of diabetes go, and when you see that, fasting blood glucose of some patient is high and as well the PPHT is also high. Although we have cases and we have series of studies talking about that both are equally harmful, there is a school of thought which talks about that maybe when you start insulin, start with once a day a dose of insulin and try fixing the fasting first. And I think we've heard a lot about basal insulins. It's not just about the conventional basal insulin. We have had analog basal insulin as well as biosimilars. Let's look into to directly case, how do we fix the baseline fasting of this particular patient first who's got diabetes since around eight years or so? I think to do these honors, I would call upon Dr. Adeline. I don't know because of network whether she was introduced or not, but over to you, Dr. Adeline. Thank you so much. Dr. Alpa. 
you are muted dr alpha you are muted uh, uh, dr adlin should i just introduce you ma'am should i share my screen please sure sure ma'am can you just stop this so that yeah, i can yeah, yeah 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 Uh, again, uh, it's just a privilege for me to introduce Dr. Adeline, ma'am. She is working as a professor of endocrinology and diabetes and metabolic in SRMC Chennai. She is a consultant endocrinologist in Sundaram Medical Foundation. She has been an excellent student in her academic years and got distinctions. She has won cash prize in ECG quiz in the EPICON Tamil Nadu chapter of 2019. Sorry, she has published papers in various of the journals. One of it is like 20 years of insulin large in 100 systematic evaluation of its efficacy and safety in type 2 diabetes. Being a part of various book chapters on topics like sulfonylurea, insulin complication of diabetes, and given various scientific talk, uh, talks on endocrinology. Over to you, ma'am. I'll just stop this. Ma'am, can you please take it forward? Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and I thank Opad for having me here today. So, as nicely put up by Dr. Altamash, I think glycemic control still remains to be the major challenge in each and every patient of us with type 2 diabetes. And once we are able to do so, I'm sure we will be able to bring down the risk of micro and macrovascular complications significantly. And that is the reason why we are still not able to curtail or bring down the number of amputations, number of cardiovascular events, and of course, uh, cardiovascular death due to diabetes. So I will take you through uh, uh, a case scenario. This is a real patient whom I had come across recently. Just to emphasize the uh, point on how important is glycemic control? What are the various means in which we can achieve glycemic control in our patients? And how to look beyond glycemic control and look at the patient as a whole? Because we don't treat numbers, rather we treat a human being, a patient who is sitting across the table. So this is about a 46-year-old gentleman who is an IT professional who comes with a background of type 2 diabetes for the last eight years. And not just diabetes, he also has a lot of other credentials like hypertension, dyslipidemia. Now, whenever we talk about a patient with type 2 diabetes, we need to look a bit beyond just the tag of type 2 diabetes. That gives us a holistic uh, look and probably our thinking becomes broader. And therefore, we'll be able to address the patient as a whole. So this is a middle-aged gentleman, again, a male gender with a sedentary lifestyle background coming to us with a long-standing diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Thankfully, he is not a smoker, but unfortunately, he presents with mild hyperosmolar symptoms like minimal weight loss, tiredness, fatigue, cachexia, polyuria. So whenever we have these kind of uh, situations, I'm sure that this is something very commonly encountered in our clinical practice. And whenever we come across patients who don't just come with values, but would come with symptoms, then we are literally pushed to find the best solution for the uh, given individual. So this uh, particular gentleman, when we look at the medications, he has already been on metformin and vildagleptin combination twice a day. And he's already on a good stiff dose of glimepiride, two milligram twice a day, again, amounting to four milligrams a day. So this uh, prescription pattern kind of tells us that he has been addressed uh, for the two major contributions for type 2 diabetes, one being the insulin resistance, which is taken care of when we give insulin sensitizer like metformin. And the second abnormality, that is the beta cell dysfunction, is taken care of by giving secretagogues like sulfonyl ureas and DPP-4 inhibitors. And above this, he's already also been put on telmisartan 40 milligram once a day and atorvastatin 10 milligram once a day for his hypertension and dyslipidemia. So here is a gentleman who has diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, presenting with symptoms suggestive of poor glycemic control and who's already been loaded with a lot of OADs, almost three OADs in full therapeutic dose and in addition to uh, ARB and a statin. Now, looking at his labs, if you see, this is not very surprising given the background of hyperosmolar symptoms in the history. His fasting plasma glucose is 174 milligrams per deciliter. The postprandial uh, glucose is around 202 milligrams. And his HPA1C is close to 2% above the target that we would rather aim to achieve in this gentleman. 
So whenever you look at the glucose profile, we need to have an additional list of investigation in order to risk stratify these individuals so that we are able to take care of the associated comorbidities as well. So the good thing is his renal functions are normal, though we find that he has a subtle microalbuminuria, which possibly could be due to the poor glycemic control as well as due to uh, early setting up of uh, microvascular complication, uh, early stage of diabetic kidney disease. His cholesterols are okay. The LDA triglycerides are well under control, possibly due to the statin effect. So this is a gentleman who has primarily come to us for glycemic control and also with symptoms that makes us to be on our toes in order to get this A1C, get his fasting and postprandial under control. Now, whenever we have a patient in whom we need to achieve a good glycemic control, we need to look at the glucose profile. It's not just about elevated fasting, elevated postprandial, but we need to uh, look a bit deeper to identify what pathophysiological abnormality does contribute to the elevated A1C mm -hmm. in this gentleman. In this case, if you look at his fasting plasma glucose, we find a significantly high fasting plasma glucose pointing towards an abnormally exaggerated hepatic glucose output and a more significant contribution of insulin resistance. When you look at the postprandial, of course, it is high. But what you see is not much significant postprandial increment when you really look at the A1C. So the A1C has been equally contributed by fasting as well as postprandial glucose. And if we are really able to uh, bring down both, we will be able to achieve the target HP A1C in this clinical scenario. So how do we really go about it? This gentleman has come with poor glycemic control. We have too many options, just like the list of menu that we see in a uh, restaurant. We have too many things to order, but we need to identify what would be the best option for this gentleman. Uh, Indus approach helps us to solve the patient's symptoms as well as to help them achieve their, their destination where they really want to be. Now, how about the lifestyle modification? Of course, this would be a nice opportunity to reiterate the fact and benefits of lifestyle intervention in these gentlemen, especially when they have hyperosmolar symptoms, they seek help for glycemic control, they are supposed to be uh, more receptive and lifestyle modification will still remain to be an important contribution for glycemic control, especially in the background of sedentary lifestyle. But unfortunately, the lifestyle modification or exercise can bring down the A1C by 0.5 to 0.6%. And therefore, that alone may not be sufficient in order to get the A1C down by 2%. What would be the next option in terms of glycemic control? Can SGLT2 inhibitors make the trick? Now, SGLT2 inhibitors, they are very good molecules. We know about their cardiovascular safety, the renal benefit, the mortality benefit and whatnot. But we need to understand that it has a modest A1C reduction with metformin about 0.8 to 1%, and that may not really suffice in this individual. And remember, this individual has come to us with a mild hyperosmolar symptom where the patient is already having polynuria, and probably they are slightly under the risk of having a subtle diabetic ketoacidosis also. And therefore, we need to be careful in not just, just adding SGLT2 inhibitors. It may be considered in addition to another drug that could give a cover, or probably later on to bring down the cardiovascular risk in this individual. Now, how about a GLP-1 receptor agonist? Again, that's a very good option, especially in patients who have associated obesity or overweight with a sedentary lifestyle, with microalbuminuria. It's a very good molecule that can bring down not just the glucose, but also the overall cardiovascular risk factors. Again, the GLP-1 analogs, we were using injectable ones. Now we have the oral GLP-1 analogs in uh, clinical practice that we are using for our patients. But again, when you have a patient with a hyperosmolar symptom, we would rather um, kind of worsen these uh, weight loss and tiredness fatigue when you add GLP-1 at this particular point. So in this particular point of the clinical situation, it may not be the right option, though it has a very good efficacy very good safety profile and would be a, probably a right choice for uh, patients like this particular gentleman. How about alpha-glucosidase inhibitor? Now, alpha-glucose inhibitor, again, is a very good uh, drug. It has shown an efficient efficacy in terms of HPLC reduction somewhere ranging between 0.5 to 1%, especially in addition to metformin. But it is a predominantly uh, a postprandial drug that brings down the postprandial glucose uh, 
exclusively. And therefore, its role in terms of bringing down the fasting to the tune of 40 to 50 milligrams would be really questionable. So this, though can be as used as an additive drug, it may not be the ideal only drug that could help this gentleman achieve his glycemic control and get symptomatically better. Now, how about an increase in the dose of glimipride? Now, this gentleman is already on a 4 milligrams of glimipride, which is the a half therapeutic uh, dose, though we talk about the maximum therapeutic dose of 8 milligrams, there are studies which have used up to even 16 milligrams a day. But we also know that beyond the half therapeutic maximal dose, a further escalation of the sulfonate urea would not really translate into HPA1C reduction. And therefore, an increase in dose of limipride may not really address the failing beta cells rather than it's like whipping the tired horse more and more and squeeze out the insulin that is uh, available in the um, uh, remaining remnant beta cell. And that may not really help us to probably achieve an A1C of 2%. So that brings us to the final molecule for this gentleman, which is insulin. Now I'm sure we will be able to know and probably agree that insulin could be the right source of drug in this gentleman at this particular point. Now, when you have an individual who has hyperosmolar symptoms, who has poor glycemic control with a predominant fasting hyperglycemia, we would, though we talk up, we understand the need for insulin, we need to also look at what kind of or what type of insulin would really do the benefit for this gentleman. Now, with a predominant post uh, fasting abnormality, with not much of a postprandial component, a basal insulin would be a very good, sensible, uh, efficacious insulin that can help patients to bring down their fasting plasma glucose. And as rightly pointed out by our chairperson, by fixing the fasting plasma glucose first, we will be able to bring down the postprandial and thereby bring down the HPA1C as well. So this gentleman was started on 100 units of uh, glargin at 10 units at the time of initiation. And it was soon titrated to 16 units at bedtime. You can see a good reduction in the fasting and therefore postprandial reduction also. And in subsequent visits, this uh, dose was titrated to 18 units. And with 18 units, we found that the fasting had come down very well, postprandial also subsequently down. And in a matter of 12 weeks, this A1C became 7.3%, which is close to 1.8% reduction with not much of significant weight gain. So, an insulin can make these patients, especially the basal analog insulins, can bring down the fasting plasma glucose and therefore the postprandial glucose with a significant HPA1C reduction. And this is in addition to a symptomatic improvement in an individual who is suffering from a poor glycemic control and hyperosmolar symptoms. So, overall, the Glargin U100 basal analog insulin has really changed the way we are initially looking at insulin. So it has an optimal efficacy and safety because we know that we are definitely be uh, able to bring down the HPA1C. It's quite convenient and therefore it improves the compliance because it's just going to be once a day shot. Self-titration is possible because we don't have much of risk of hypoglycemia and therefore patients can self-titrate or can be uh, done remotely. The patient has the doesn't have to waste time and money to make a hospital visit. Very less hypoglycemia because there's no prandial component automatically it offers a better acceptance from the patient's point of view because socially it becomes acceptable because the shot needs to be taken only at bedtime after reaching the home. So it improves the quality of life in terms of symptomatic improvement. And above everything, it is quite cost effective. And therefore, the number of errors is also much less with uh, basal analog instead. So this is a gentleman which I have uh, encountered with a fasting hyperglycemia who did really well with a basal analog glargenist. Now, to conclude, I would say that though we know which insulin, uh, uh, that insulin needs to be started, we need to look at several parameters like the patient's profile, the glucose profile, the comorbidity profile before we really decide on which insulin would be the best for the given individual who's sitting across the table. So thank you very much for the opportunity and I would close my presentation here. Thank you. I think a very well accepted and a very well done presentation dr edlin thank you so much for that and i think you brought out very good the reasons especially why you would choose a particular drug why you would not choose a drug and especially if the patient is already on why you would not increase a particular kind of a drug uh very well done 
I think uh, in the interest of time, since we were ten minutes late to start, can we have the second speaker and then go for a Q and A session? Is that okay with our organizers? Sure, sir. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, now, when we have understood that a patient of a complication of diabetes, whether it is non-infective or infective, whether it is a macrovascular or microvascular, a single patient at the same time can have a microvascular with a macrovascular. For example. A, a retinopathy with a diabetic foot, or a nephropathy with a diabetic foot, or the patient may have two microvascular complications together. For example, a stroke and a peripheral artery disease, or a heart disease and a peripheral artery disease, or at times we do see polyvascular disease where there are more than two vessels involved, and the patient has got similarly this kind of a polyvascular and an active diabetic foot, whether it's a Charcot foot or Uh, osteomyelitis or something else, and the major challenge that we face in India is that we we believe in a lot of spirituality. We believe in a in 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 a in a in a lot of understanding that we should not be wearing some footwear in the house or when we enter outside the house for some special reasons and specific reasons. However, diabetes people need to be educated about diabetic foot precautions, about how they should be having a a better protective footwear and foot care that needs to be done. in that context how do you first treat when the patient is indoors or when the patient has got an active infection and you've used your baseline drugs so from treating off from a baseline drug do we have another entity do we have a new chemical do we have a new molecule like we have for lipids we have saraglutazar which is an indian made molecule we also have from our today's organizers a new chemical entity that's the levonado Fluoxetine, and let us look into the data on a case-to-case basis. And to do this justice, I think I would call upon Dr. Gaurav Jain, and I think he'll be introduced, and then you take over from there. Dr. Gaurav Jain, please. Thank you, sir. I'll I'll ask Dr. Alpa for the introductions. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll just share the screen for us. So Dr. Gaurav Gaurav Jain he has been an excellent student and holds distinction in rheumatology from John Hopkins Baltimore he has been awarded for the exemplary performance in the year of 2007 and 8 he has a vast expe- uh, vast work experience from the various hospitals but currently working as a consultant and a head of department of internal medicine and endocrine diseases he's also been managing rheumatology in the same space in dharamshila narayana super specialty hospital he has a vast rich ex- uh, research experience as an investigator like tor1 adapt study in the year of 2018 star2 trail study on diabetes follow up in the year of 2016 he has been a part of various publication and also given oral talks oral presentation on heart failure and diabetes and well, like biosimilar are they actually similar and many more in his bag so over to you sir I'll just stop this screen. Over to Sir Dr. Gaurav Jain. I I hope you guys can see the screen. So we can see. Okay, yes, sir, we can see the screen, sir. Hi everyone, and thank you for the warm welcome. Ah, uh, so today's topic is very simple. We are basically talking about the role of levonadi fluoxetine in the management of diabetic foot infections. Now, diabetic foot infections or diabetic foot ulcers are basically a uh, complication that tend to happen. because of a lot of things but three major factors play a role in that the first is the acute glycosylation of the skin and the tendons in the foot there is body deformity that follows that the second is the atherosclerosis the blood supply to that tissue tends to get affected and the third is the nerve supply and all of them together leads to the incidence of diabetic foot ulcers Now, diabetic foot ulcers are important to manage, and in a country like India, we are very bad at it. In international standards, you see there's a whole branch of medicine like podiatry, which is surgical and medical management of the foot diseases. We do not have that. We have very poor foot care in our country, despite the fact that we have the largest population, one of the largest populations of diabetes in the world. Diabetic patients, if you see the screen, you will realize they have a 15 to 25 percent lifetime incidence of developing diabetic foot ulcers, and infections can be severe. They can have costly complications with a high risk of mortality and morbidity due to lower limb amputations and wound infections. 
and not only amputations and infection it can leave a patient with a very bad quality of life they are restricted to the bed they are not able to move around they have a uh, social phobia their foot tend to smell they are recurrent mood infection they are recurrent pains and 80% of lower limb amputations in diabetic patients are preceded by a by a biofilm infected foot ulceration these ulcerations can um, then lead to prolonged infections which when left untreated or improperly treated can affect the bone and in these cases amputation and surgical resections are very important infected wounds result in an increased risk of death within 18 months and this risk is almost 5.6 times higher in these patients when compared to even normal diabetic patients Now, DFI is a potentially disastrous and progress rapidly when the sugar control, the blood pressure control, and the other hygiene controls are not very well maintained. And if not treated promptly and appropriately, DFI can be incurable. They can lead to sepsis, gangrene, foot amputation, and death. Both of most of the infections are polymicrobial. Well, gram-positive organisms like Staph aureus and Streptococcus and E. faecalis and all of these organisms are the major players and mrsa is now present in about 32% of diabetic infections as per the latest study and if you look at the last 5 to 10 years of data it seems that the mrsa percentages are getting higher it is associated with a higher rate of treatment failure morbidity and hospitalization costs in patients with dfis according to the icmr when you look at the data you would realize that uh, the overall rates have increased from uh, 28.4% in 2016 to 20 uh, from in 2021 the data showed that almost 42.6% of all reported diabetic foots had mrsa infections and these were uh, resistant to erythromycin clindamycin ciprofloxacin ortrimoxazole and even mupirocin now we have certain drugs against the um, mrsa agents the common ones that you remember and you see and you have had around are clindamycin picoplanin and vancomycin there is uh, tegicycline lenazolin and daptomycin Uh, each of them are good drugs but each of them have certain side effects and certain limitations so with tico and vanco there is the risk of nephrotoxicity and you need to reduce the dose in the environment these are slow bactericidal agents given as injectables the oral formulation of vancomycin is not readily available not readily effective as well there is a very narrow spectrum of coverage there is variable tissue penetration and it does not work very well in acidic and in biofilm areas there are no oral formulation and they can be dosing issues also there is something called as hemic cream with uh, the there is an associated vancomycin induced uh, resistance that can develop in these patients and it takes about 3 days to reach therapeutic levels so there is a time interval and there are limitation to these drugs the other drug on the other end is linazolid it's a very good drug it has a very good bacteriostatic activity but the effects can be it can lead to thrombocytopenia in all an already septic patient where in the risk of dic is high this can itself be a lot of problems there is peripheral and optic neuropathy lactic acidosis serotonin syndrome which can be present and it is not approved from mrsa bacteremia it also has a narrow spectrum of coverage the other drug is daptomycin and again it is not approved for lung infection as it is inactivated by pulmonary surfactant it can cause skeletal muscle toxicity in high doses and again like the vancomycin and ticoplanin there is decreased susceptibility and narrow spectrum of coverage with no oral formulation tegicycline has a black box warning for uh, mortality and uh, life uh, uh, issues but apart from that it's a good drug for bacteriostatic activity no oral formulation and requires a rooting dose and if there is hepatic impairment there is dose modification required which leaves us with clindamycin which i think is the most commonly used drug in this class it has bacteriostatic activity there is high resistance now because of its high usage 
there is diarrhea and especially C. diff diarrhea and colitis, which can themselves be fatal. So there are certain limitations to all the available agents right now. So to overcome these limitations, the molecule that uh, we are talking about here is called Embroc and it is given alifloxacin. It is both available as an IV and an oral formulation and it is a novel one-of-a-kind benzoquinolone structure which basically is the antiseptic or antibiotic action which imparts a unique mode of action. It has a broader coverage and excellent safety. It is able to block both the GDNA kinase and the GDNA replication uh, bacteria. It has a broad spectrum of activity and means MDR gram positive, including MRSA, VRSA, VISA, GISA, MR cons, uh, and dancomycin resistant E. fecalis, among others. It is also effective against all quinolone sensitive gram negative bacteria. It is effective against atypical and anaerobic bacteria to some extent as well. It is rapid in its bactericidal activity, even against low bone growing staphylococci and even in the presence of high bacterial load. It is also useful in bloodstream infections and can also be used to treat infective endocarditis. Because of its uh, molecular structure, it has good biofilm uh, penetration, about 90% ability to eradicate the biofilm and good almost four times higher potency in the acidic environment. And then it also has an excellent tissue penetration. Now, there have been some studies which have suggested it also has some immunomodulatory activity and it reduces TNF alpha and other inflammatory cytokines in patients. These are all animal studies. We do not have human data for this fact as well. Matching pharmacokinetics profiles of oral and IV formulations make it easier to switch from parenteral to oral therapy. The oral formulation is a prodrug and it is, has a bioavailability of 90% that of the IV. So it is able to actually achieve similar effects. So 800 milligrams of IV MROC is equivalent to 1000 milligrams of oral MROC. This basically allows us to transition between both oral and IV drugs based on the patient requirement. There is no need of any loading dose irrespective of body weight. And uh, again, no TDM requirement, no dose adjustment, even in severe hepatic or renal failure. It has superior safety in terms of no QT prolongation, no seizure potential, no phototoxic potential, no thrombocytopenia, and no hepatic enzyme elevation. It can be safely used for long-term therapy. The maximum therapy duration used till now is 41 days. So, I'm just trying to present to you a sample case and this uh, for a safe uh, in the patient where you can see that this patient here has a diabetic foot. Uh, it has already been treated, it has already been treated and this is a patient coming to you in the outpatient department. This is not a very uh, rich patient, uh, she is not very willing for recurrent admission but the diabetic foot is hurting, it is swelling, it is developing pus again and she is not comfortable. So we have a patient, Mrs. S, 60-year-old female. She is currently on multivitamins with calcium, vitamin D, uh, antiseptic soap. She is on augmentin 1 gram, uh, twice daily, a statin, a clopidogrel, an antihistaminin and anti-inflammatories. Um, I hope they are not NSAID. I hope they are not uh, going to affect the kidney. But uh, she's on these medicines and she's been presented to you with management of diabetes, diet control, exercise, self-monitoring of blood glucose at home, regular food care, general hygiene, regular follow-up at least three times a year has been advised and she has been trying to do her best. Her HB1C levels are at 7.9 with a blood sugar fasting of 134, a postprandial of 209. She, a pus culture has been sent, is awaited. Um, the lipid profile is available with you. She has decent cholesterol levels, mild hypertriglyceridemia, and her CBC, LFT, and KFT has been sent, and she is unwilling to get admitted. You need to control this infection, and you are basically seeing some degree of fever in this patient. You are also seeing some kind of swelling. You are also seeing some tenderness, and you are also seeing that this patient is showing some toxicity on the face. So the next step that you do is actually more important. You have 
send the reports and you start to see and you start to get some results. Think, uh, first culture initial reports is gram positive. Pokai, you're not sure which one is this, but you at least have an infection guideline. The CBC shows a mild uh, reduction in platelet counts, TLC is 14.3, 84%. Neutrophil, alcreatinine is 1.56. So you're not very comfortable using NCA there. Uh, the liver functions are okay, her albumin levels are a little bit low, and she's told about the risk of amputation. Her peripheral pulses are present, although they are feeble, there is some neuropathy present as well. And uh, going further down the line, when you actually see her, and after counseling her, after being on her case, you do realize that she is monitored. You have to start on oral medications and what would be the treatment of this. So this patient in her case was basically given uh, offloading treatment with paraffin gauze and tegaderm coating, a backup lurmin ointment twice daily, along with a broad spectrum basic basic corticosteroid and antifungal cream. Uh, glycemic control was sharpened by the addition of cetagliptin, metformin, and dobigatazone. And uh, Along with that, MROC, oral formulation, spice a day, augmentin, which was continued, and Zocon was added. The good point was that in 10 days of treatment, she, uh, wherein she was advised to undergo amputation, there was an improvement in the condition. So, using these therapies, we saw that the infective lines and the uh, pus collection in the joints, as well as the inflammation, was better. So there was almost a 50% improvement within the first 10 days of treatment alone. And this is the benefit of good therapy that we're talking about. So this is still guideline directed therapy. You need to add, make sure that the patient is on something to ensure the proper blood flow. There should be proper broad spectrum, ground positive cover for this patient. And MROC did the job fabulously. Good glycemic control. The blood pressure was already under control and we did not give any kind of renal damage to the patient. So now we're talking about these drugs, MROC and MROC. These are two important drugs that we need to be aware of and these are the drug profiles for these drugs. So the drugs are levonadifloxacin as the injectable form or halalevonadifloxacin, which is the precursor formulation. And the dose of you know, levonadifloxacin is 800 milligrams given twice a day. And as you understand, it has 90% bioequivalence. So about 1000 milligrams of an oral formulation given twice a day has the same effect. The average duration of therapy is somewhere between 7 to 10 days. And the IV is obviously used in the hospital setting itself. And the oral formulation can be used in the outpatient and as a step down uh, process in the hospital. The uh, profile of again oral and IV uh, drugs is pretty similar when you actually see these. And that is what gives you confidence in using both of these drugs as in bioequivalent drugs. So there is overlapping PK profiles. You can switch from IV to oral very easily. And the fact is that these drugs in the uh, stomach are absorbed by the amino acid transporter rather than uh, something else, which uh, mediates efficient absorption and efficient clearance of this drug. So this drug is again excluded both in the urine as well as the stool and does not require hepatic uh, met metabolism. Uh, it is activated through the liver through phase through ligation, you do get a sulfide group added to the allylevonadifloxacin to equate it to the levonadifloxacin IV. But it has a broad spectrum of coverage and it has a quick response in these patients. So in the staphylococci category, you have the MRSA, QRSA, GIS, MRSA, MR cons and QR cons, the full forms of which are given on the side, which basically is telling you that it is active against most of these gram positive. Kokai and the fact is it's a new drug, it's an Indian drug, and it has almost 100% efficacy and, and against these. Against the enterobacterials, uh, again, the chloroquinone susceptible ones are controlled by this. For the pseudomonas, acetobacterium, mantophilia, and 
Echinococcus. Again, the non fermenters, fluoroquinolones, susceptible ones are under this. Legionella chlamydia, mycoplasma, H. influenzae, and monoxyla catarrhalis. Again, in terms of the community respiratory infections, this is something important. The bacteria Pseudomalai, Malai, Tularemia, Pestis, and Anthrax. This is again our response to this. It works against C. diff. It again uh, works against Peptoseptococcus, Propinobacter, Bacteroides, and Prevotella. And it also works against the E. fecalis in the vancomycin resistance. But in terms of kind of E. fecium, the sensitivity is a little bit less. It is almost equivalent to that of picoplanin of around 40% only. And in terms of uh, streptococci, it almost has a 100% effect. It is very active on the biofilm. So, in vitro bactericidal activity of genome fluxation, the active component being WCK771, against MRSA and quinolone resistant staphylococcus biofilms tended to show that WCK771 was very active in penetrating the uh, bacterial cells and in terms of clearing of the biofilms. So, when you look at the untreated biofilm structure versus daptomycin versus linozolid versus clindamycin, MROC had a much higher effect and that too at a lower MIC. So, unlike others, MROC has 90% bacterial eradication against biofilm embedded staphylococcus aureus. This is very important when you're looking at bony infections, when you're looking at joint infection, and when you're also looking at and cardiac infection inside the heart. In terms of safety profile, the data is available for more than 45,000 patients and uh, the studies have been conducted for in closed environments for more than 2,600 patients. There is no nephrotoxicity, there is no hepatotoxicity, there is no QTC interval prolongation, there is no thrombocytopenia and since there is no CRP mediated drug to drug interaction. It also has poor blood-brain barrier uh, penetration. So the risk of seizures with, uh, which you feel with other fluoroquinolones are not as prevalent here. So it is unrivaled in its safety profile. And it is something that you need to understand about this molecule that you have had this confidence of using fluoroquinolones for a very long time. And you have used these products Primarily because of the fact that they had these benefits against other uh, antibiotics that were there. And the similar benefits carry forward to this molecule as well. There is no dose adjustment in renal enzymatic impairment, no seizure potential, no phototoxicity as well. So the clinical use of MROC is approved in acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections diabetic foot infections, concurrent bacteremia along with these infections, and the potential indications can include and will soon include community-acquired pneumonia, bone and joint infections, febrile neutropenia, bone marrow transplantation, device-associated infections, and catheter-related bloodstream infections as well. So thank you for a very patient hearing, and uh, let's take up any questions uh, we have for this. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav Jain. I think very well elucidated about the diabetic foot and the case. And very nicely, you've actually also told about which antibiotic and why. I think that brings us to a lot of questions. I have received questions from the organizers and some of the panelists have actually WhatsApp me on my personal number some questions. But I'm also a little uh, very curious about the topic. So I'll try to receive the questions to our current, both the speakers and I think the first question, which is actually common to both of you is, I don't know the name of the delegate, but uh, the question is, is there a role of prophylactic antibiotic in an uncontrolled diabetes in an indoor setting? So uncontrolled diabetes admitted role of prophylactic antibiotic. Both of you can take, maybe Dr. Gaurav, you can start, then we'll call Dr. Adeline to trip in this answer. See, if you are an uncontrolled diabetic and you are admitted into a hospital, you probably 
have some degree of some complication that is leading to their admission and most likely cause in that scenario is going to be infection so yes i would say uh, you will probably be on an antibiotic but starting that prophylactically might not make as much sense i would say that work up of the patient based on a cbc a culture a urine examination will show us that if an antibiotic or an antifungal or some kind of medication in that format is needed or okay thanks for that dr edlin i think as far as i know the prophylactic usage of antibiotic is restricted to recurrent urinary tract infection so beyond which i am not very sure i am not aware of any uh, recommendation for prophylactic use of antibiotics in uh, uncontrolled diabetes absolutely i think we would look at it in this way first of all in this era of 2023 when you have such nice drugs to control and so many options of insulin i would not admit any patient only to control diabetes i would call this patient maybe daily or alternate days or give them an online consultation option the very fact that in the question somebody has written that indoor so why was the patient admitted would decide the use of antibiotics but prophylactically i think is a very big question mark we have to get into more details of this kind of case and then look at it from there because if it's cellulitis and an uncontrolled diabetes yes the answer would be you may need to then in that case given antibiotic so maybe we need more clarifications for the question itself but just antibiotic and uncontrolled diabetes i think that is going to to be understood with then individualized question and the case in question so the next question to you dr edlin somebody is asking in an obese individual if you give insulin there are further chances the patient may gain weight your thoughts on this we should be prudent before we really initiate insulin so only when it's indicated we are going to use insulin and i think weight gain should not be a limiting factor for uh, using insulin in a given uh, appropriate indicated scenario uh, having said that the newer insulins especially the analog insulins are associated with much less weight gain compared to the conventional insulin and of course when you don't have a prandial component for the example in the basal analog insulins especially the second generation based analog insulins i think the weight gain is very negligible and therefore that should not be a consideration uh, for uh, initiation or intensification of insulin therapy and the other thing is we also have a lot of oads that can uh, complement the insulin in terms of maintaining the weight uh, in the neutral range or probably even achieve weight loss especially when you have a combination of insulin plus glp analog or insulin plus sgt2 inhibitors we are even uh, able to achieve weight loss uh, uh, in addition to insulin so i think it depends on the uh, the indication for the given individual and probably we have to make a prudent choice to offer the maximum benefit for the patient okay. dr godav your thought your pointers anything in one line you want to talk about this question weight gain and insulin i think she has said it all uh, the basic point is that we have now drugs which can neutralize the weight gain that you get from insulin i would say but yes insulin is a subjective treatment and well treated patients will actually benefit in the long run i think i agree with both of you but also we should look into when the insulin is started has this particular patient lost weight before starting insulin a lot of people with uncontrolled diabetes will have some amount of weight loss and that re weight regain to their normal baseline weight should not be confused with that the that weight gain is because of insulin so we need to look at it number one number two be very judicious in giving insulin doses so that there is no hypoglycemia and there is no defensive snacking which may lead to weight gain we need to prevent the weight gain if at all it is occurring and the last point that i would like to make is do not start with mdi in a very very uncontrolled patient directly because that itself unless the patient has lost weight as i said earlier then only and weight regain should not be confused with this so i think that brings me to the third question somebody is asking why gliptin is to be given with sgl2 inhibitor and how do they prevent infection further i think both of you can take it i think uh, from the pathophysiological angle they complement each other they are able to address most of the pathophysiological abnormalities that contribute to hyperglycemia so in that way the efficacy in terms of hpnc reduction is much better rather than given alone so that is one of the major reasons especially in a uh, uncontrolled diabetes setup but uh, beyond that when you look at it from the infection angle because of the dpp4 enzyme in the fungus and the bacteria that will be inhibited when it is used concurrently with sgl2 inhibitors 
the risk of uh, genetic uh, genital uh, infections especially the mycotic infections have come down drastically down this has been shown in the clinical studies the, um, so therefore uh, when we are really wanting to use sgt2 inhibitors if we use it in combination with bpp4 inhibitors uh, it's um, two birds and in one stone gives you glycemic control and also reduces the risk of infection okay dr gaurav anything to be added in this i think the uh, He said the basic point, and uh, another thing that you tend to notice is the amount of glycosuria in these patients tend to come down because of the fact that there is sugar reduction by the use of a DPP four inhibitor itself. So the amount of times that the urine will show glycosuria tends to be less in patients on this combination. That also tends to help. I think right. So there is an enzyme called as. Uh, capsaicin in the urinary bladder wall, which gets modulated with the presence of DPP-4 inhibitors, and that's how it prevents any further UTIs with an addition of an SGLT2 inhibitors. However, we should also check into asymptomatic bacteriuria, and asymptomatic bacteriuria should not be confused with recurrent UTI, where you would not give any kind of an antibiotic. I think I have a lot of other questions which are not related to today's topic. I would like to know from the organizer: Should we be taking those? Questions unrelated to the topic because it's already eight thirty one now. Sir, understanding today being a, a day of festivities and uh, we have started on time. We wish to finish on time. The discussion had been fabulous so far, so we thank you for that. I would now invite uh, Mr. Rahul Dave, our marketing head for uh, Antibiotic Discovery Division, to give the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone. thank you specially dr almas for chairperson being the chairperson of this scientific initiative i would also like to thank dr aldelin for giving us an insight when it comes to a basal insulin usage to a case study also i would like to thank dr gaurav jain for helping us to for the insight when it comes to usage of amrock in diabetic food infection and uh, especially vocard would always be a part when it comes to a scientific uh, initiatives and dell 20 summit is one of them and thanks a lot for being a part of them and also so vocard is a company which always believes in coming up with new chemical entities and emrock being one of them there are a lot of pi products in pipeline which will be coming up a big blaster and especially in the antibiotic space where there is very little spay uh, research done Uh, Vocard being one of the company which is the high in terms of coming up with not only the very tough to treat infection that is MDR gram positive infection but also MDR gram negative also. So again, uh, on behalf of Vocard, thanks a lot to all the uh, <clears throat> doctors and also my dear colleagues and also the uh, doctors who have been a part of an audience to being a part of this uh, scientific initiative and giving us your valuable time. Thanks a lot. With this, I would like to conclude the. uh the l20 summit sir thanks a lot sir to everyone thank, thank you all you have thank a great you so evening. much everyone a happy eid again and akshay tritya thank you thank you thank you everyone sir happy eid and happy akshay tritya